Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning. Good evening to some. Um, I'm Jonathan Brent. I'm executive director and CEO of the YIBO Institute for Jewish Research. I think that um, we are very, very privileged today to have as our keynote speaker for YIBO's winter program, uh, Grigory Yavlinsky. Uh, about whom I will say a bit more uh, shortly. But I would like to begin uh, for those of you who have tuned in uh, by saying a couple of words about the YIVO Institute, which you may not know a great deal about. YIVO stands for the Jewish um, Research Institute, the Institute for Jewish Research. Uh, it was uh, Yiddisher Wissenschaftlicher Institute in Yiddish. It was founded in Vilna, Poland, now Vilnius, Lithuania, uh, the capital of Lithuania, in 1925 by uh, historians and by intellectuals who had, for the most part, fled the revolution in Russia. Its purpose was to create for the first time an academy of higher learning for the Jewish people of Eastern Europe. And in the process of doing so, uh, because there was no uh, such institution before YIBO, and in the process of building this uh, institution for higher learning of the Jewish people, it amassed an enormous library and an enormous archive. Much of it was destroyed by the Nazis in 1941 when they invaded the Soviet Union, but some of it was saved. Some of it was sent to Germany by the Nazis, but other parts of YIVO's uh, tremendous archive were hidden in Lithuania, in Vilnius. And much of the story of modern YIVO is the story of the uncovering and the rediscovery and the re reclamation, so to speak, of these very, very vital archives, which one scholar called the Dead Sea Scrolls of the Jews of Eastern Europe. Today, YIVO is a global organization with educational programs and public programs um, uh, uh, with uh, exhibits, uh, and uh, with um, a multiplicity of, uh, of uh, initiatives in our archives and our library. Uh, we serve scholars all over the world. And because of the internet, uh, we now reach people all over the world. As is evident today, where uh, we have not only uh, guests from virtually all 50 states in the United States, but also from China and Israel, England, Germany, Canada, Mexico, Latvia, Lithuania, Scotland, India, South Africa, Brazil, France, and, and other countries as well. So the mission of the, of the YIVO Institute is to reach the Jewish people of Ashkenazi descent all over the world. And not just to reach them, but to um, understand what it is that uh, what what it is that they need in order to reconnect with their history and reconnect with their heritage. The purpose of our winter program, which was started. I think by uh, six years ago, is to set Jewish history in the perspective of the great historical forces surrounding it, but of which it was a part and which to a great extent have shaped the lives and experience of all of us living today. Therefore, we have programs uh, on, on uh, uh, the Jews in Argentina, on Borges and the Jews, on 
uh, rock and roll and, and the Jews in the winter program. In the summer program, we teach the Yiddish language and we teach the Yiddish language to people uh, all over the world now through the internet. This year, given the events in the United States and around the world, we have decided uh, to make the theme of this year's winter program that of tyranny and authoritarianism, out of which so much bitter Jewish experience took shape in the 20th century, in lands where Jews lived for some 1,000 years, in a thriving civilization and culture, and which many Jews continue to live in, in the erasure of that culture and civilization, and in the shadow of the catastrophe of authoritarianism. Russia has been at the crossroads of Jewish history of Eastern Europe for centuries. The revolution gave impetus to millennial hopes for liberation. Its aftermath, especially in Ukraine in 1919-1920, foreshadowed the cataclysm of the Shoah. Today, Russia continues for many of us in the West to be a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. Is it an example of what our own future in the US might become? Will it give way to liberal democratic rebirth? In 1993, the former head of army intelligence of the United States, and who was a colleague of mine at Yale University, said to me, Russia no longer matters, to my astonishment. Well, no one can say that today. Russia does matter. And I can think of no one who could give us a clearer sense of how it matters and what the future may hold than Grigory Yavlinsky. Dr. Yavlinsky is a Russian economist and politician, a proponent of market-oriented reforms under Gorbachev. Yavlinsky has been a key figure in the opposition in post-Soviet Russia with the independent liberal party Yavlako for which he was the 2018 presidential candidate. His books include Real Economique, The Hidden Cause of the Great Recession and How to Avert the Next One in 2011, Incentives and Institutions, 19, uh, 2000, and 500 Days, Transition to the Market. He teaches at the National Research University Higher School of Economics in Moscow, and was the head of the Department of Economy and the Council of Ministers, and therefore an official uh, in the Soviet government, the head of a special group for research and study. Yavlinsky is probably best known as the author of the 500 Days Program, a plan for the transition of the USSR to a free market economy, and for his leadership of the social liberal Yavlinko party. He has run for Russia's presidency three times, in 1996 against Boris Yeltsin, finishing fourth, and in 2000 and 2018 against Vladimir Putin. The Putin System, which is his most recent book, and which forms the uh, occasion for today's lecture, has been praised widely uh, as, quote, a carefully crafted and concisely written uh, argument uh, made about the Putin system. It is analytically strong and thought provoking. Uh, Strobe Talbot of the Brookings Institute has written, Grigory Yavlinsky's book is of great importance. He gives us a clear eyed diagnosis of Putinism. He also reminds us that Russia has brave, determined reformers who have on their side logic, principles, lessons from the past and present that will guide their remedies for the future. And so I am very privileged and I am very honored uh, to introduce uh, Grigory Yavlinsky, but also to call him a friend. 
He is a man who has been both a an, an uh, uh, a a researcher and a commentator on events in Russia, but moreover a participant in those events and therefore holds a very special place in our understanding of the modern Russia. So, Grigori, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really very honored to have a floor in such important institution and to such important audience. Before I start talking about Russia, I want to say some words at the very beginning uh, and uh, to underline that, as you already know, I devoted this talk to Mr. Jonathan Brandt, outstanding academician, scientist, author, and publisher. You know, I want to tell you that whenever I go on my political and social meetings, and as a public politician, I have a lot of them, and my pre-election tours, as soon as I meet with historians and archivists in Russia, it always turns out they all know Jonathan Brandt. Moreover, they respect and value Brandt. Why? Naturally, for his input in historical discourse of Soviet Russia. He first came in Russia as a publisher back in 92, in January 92, 30 years ago. He, as many people inside Russia, was rightly sure that it is important for the whole world, and first of all, for Russia itself, to find out what really happened in the country between 1917 and 1991. Right after the collapse of the Soviet Union, many people seriously and absolutely rightly believed that this kind of knowledge was absolutely necessary and is a kind of guarantee. The knowledge would keep the country from living through its very black pages again. Academician Jonathan Brandt started a big and very important archival project. His project did not engage vilification as not about emphasizing clearly negative parts of history. There were many very different things in the history of USSR, heroic and tragic. Those that testify the high spirit of the Russian people and the terrible crimes of the regime against its own people. And all this was honestly, honestly reflected in the documents published by Yale U Press, Yale University Press in the Annals of Communism, in the series of Annals of Communism. Each volume was compiled by two co-editors, one American, and one Russian. They selected the documents together, and as a result, any reader can restore a completely objective picture of events. Nobody pressed the editors, no one expected them to adjust their views to any pre-developed concept. And what was most important in this series they published the collection of documents. It was not just talks about and around documents, which no one had ever seen, but the documents themselves. Many were published for the first time, the first and it seems the last time. For historians, it is simply priceless. All this concept was developed by Jonathan Brandt. 
All of this work was structured and facilitated by Jonathan. I was told by his colleagues and everybody knows that more than once he offered to publish identical volumes in Russia. He wanted to help Russian publishers to do it. As I said, many people in Russia understood the significance of Brandt's work, but not politicians. Politicians and so-called reformers focused entirely on economic transformation. They didn't understand that without a full and honest assessment of Stalinism and the Soviet period, as Jonathan Brandt was doing, no economic transformation could change the country. Moreover, the transformations with a very high probability will turn into crimes. And so it happened. That's why, unfortunately, such studies have not been in demand. Russian politicians and publishers, commercial and even academic, did not understood the vital need to analyze history and to learn from the past. That's why we now are, in fact, in authoritarian, corporative state and back in a Cold War times. Academician Jonathan Brent did his best to prevent that. And that is why the lecture about current political system is very right to dedicate to him. There was one more aspect in Brandt's work in Russia, which people seem to remember warmly. It was and remains as a personal touch. You see, when Russia opened the archives, crowds of eager publishers came over. They came like birds of prey, fell like stones from the sky, grabbed what they think were the best pieces and flew away. Academician Brent was completely different. He cared to build relationships, cared about the people and worked with them. The life for ordinary people, especially for historians and archivists, was really hard back then. That's no secret. He initiated a long-term long -term joint project, not only in word, but also in deed. Jonathan, many serious intellectuals and your friends in Moscow welcome you and celebrate your contribution to the history of Russian transformation. They remember you and hope to see you again as soon as this pandemic is over. And now I want to say the main thoughts on the topic of today's lecture, bearing in mind that in discussion with Jonathan, we will be able to discuss the topic in more detail and then will answer the questions of the audience. I would start with short explanation about the very beginning, the days when Jonathan came to Russia with Yeltsin's Russia. During the early and mid nineties, Russia's post-Soviet political system passed the first of its road fork by choosing an authoritarian model of development instead of based on political competition. Russia developed this kind of political system gradually, step by step, but quite, quite consistently and steadily. Russia's system of governance, which was in principle created by then, can be described as a peripheral authoritarian because first Russia's capitalism remains a typical but distinctive example of the periphery of the world economy. 
It is economically as well as technologically dependent on the core of global economy made up of the developed countries of the West. Secondly, it also lacks internal engines of growth and development in the form of an autonomous, autonomous accumulation of capital built on a technological foundation that would have the ability to renew itself. This system excludes the replacement of the ruling circle without simultaneous breakup of the entire system. It is orientated toward its own self-preservation. It excludes the possibility of spontaneously evolving or reforming itself in accordance with a changing environment. Finally, this is a system based upon the redistribution of rents resulting from administrative power. Those now who present the 90s as a period of unprecedented blooming of democracy in Russia tend to omit the fact that no one within Russia's ruling circle at that time accepted the possibility of voluntarily transmit the power to another group of people on the basis of its winning more votes than Boris Yeltsin. But if the presidential elections of 1996, in which I took part, still held a tiny chance for the country to take a different direction and possibly transition to a liberal competition-based political system, in 1996, 1999, that probability fell to a statistically negligible level. The factors in the 90s that led to the present day peripheral authoritarian system, the factors which today are the, the most fundamental grounds of the today's Putin system in Russia, include several important stones. One, the fusion of governmental power with the ownership of economic assets, which arose due to the first hyperinflation of 1992, 2,600% a year. In fact, the government's, it was a, in fact, it was the government's expropriation of savings, or in other words, confiscation of all means of livelihood for 150 million people. Secondly, manipulative semi-criminal privatization of 1995-1997 well-known and so-called the loans for shares auctions and almost complete subordination of all politically influential media in 1996, 1998, in order to distort the election results and most importantly, to hide the criminal nature of privatization. The second point, big point, important point, was that the authorities refused to reassess Soviet era history and pass judgment of the government level on the legacy of Stalinism and Bolshevism. It was the reformers, Bolsheviks methods, whereby the ends justify the means, which probably would not have happened if the work of Jonathan Brent had been heard in Russia, or by the way, 
at least in America, which then had a huge influence in Russia. The prevailing response in the West to the tectonic political shifts that occurred in the Soviet Union was from my point of view, professionally short-sighted and politically selfish. The political shift was reviewed as merely an opportunity to get rid of an old irritant and to make this irreversible. Having lost a practical interest in developing a rational framework of relationships as it had done with the Soviet Union, the West began to marginalize Russia in various contexts, both as a country and as a people. That was the preconditions of the Putin's Russia. The turn of the 21st century was no turning point. There was no switch, no switch from one set of principles and one system governance to another. It was all the same. What happened around 2000 was that the system of rule that had already by then taken shape had become structured, in some way strengthened, and then transitioned into a new stage of its experience and existence. During the 2000s, Russia passed a second major road fork, choosing a conservative, stagnation-inclined type of authoritarian system, even over possible modernizing top type of personal rule. In the past decade, rent extraction by the authorities has been ongoing and even blooming. In fact, all major costs of economic activities in Russia, the cost of labor, the cost of energy, transportation costs, administrative burdens, real estate rents, security costs, and so on, have been rapidly increasing since the turn of the century, with the exception of a brief period during the 2008-2009 global financial crisis. Corruption has become exorbitant, facilitating the outflow of capital. Authoritarian system tend to be rather colorless in ideological terms. But in the early 2010s, Putin's system became much more interested in developing an ideological stance to brainwash ordinary Russians after it became evident that the period of nearly automatic rapid growth of incomes, thanks to phenomenally high oil prices, was coming to an end and that the opportunities for the appropriation and dis distribution of administrative rents had it hit their limits. A cult of specific traditional values has emerged since then. And with it, three ideological trends appears. Relentless propaganda of the need for strong power. Supporting the authorities is portrayed as the civic duty of the people, regardless of the extent of disagreements among them. Finally, the third ideological tenet, postulate, 
is a hostile international environment. Russia's 2014 intervention in Ukraine and annexation of Crimea was a decision, personal decision of Putin, who was given some kind of authority to use military force abroad with no reservation of prior discussion. Its justification, a new version of a so-called Eurasian empire building ideology was presented as an alternative to European values. At the same time, the role played by the Ukrainian crisis in authoritarian regimes turn towards self-isolation from the West should not be overstated. The crisis only provided a convenient pretext for Russia's ruling elite to make a show of its di divorce from the West. Russia has become a full-blown autocracy with markedly peripheral features and a tendency towards stagnation. It is isolating itself, regressing, and transitioning from the peripheral to provincial. The policy of self-isolation implies that any international contacts with individual agencies and now even private persons that do not directly involve the people at the top of the pyramid of power are a potentially dangerous activity. Regardless of its distinctive country-specific features, we are witnessing the country's regression into a pre-modern state, meaning that government does not serve the nation as a whole, but is an aggregate sum of corporate units holding administrative power, each of which carries out tasks related to its own survival and prosperity, while also fulfilling certain obligations to those possessing more resources and authority. If Russia slips into that kind of locality and isolation, it will be marked by a pronounced reluctance to change one's position on the global order of things, as well as the conviction that the familiar status quo and involving way of life are the best option possible. The media will start portraying poverty as a beneficial and describing stagnation as fidelity to tradition. I must say that Russia is by no means inherently anti-Western, but the rise of peripheral authoritarian system has resulted in antagonistic relations with the key Western powers. The ruling circle has decided that a conspicuous isolation of self-isolation of Russia from the West suits them better than attempts to adjust their behavior to the West and its rules. Many of Russia's policies stem from the leadership's resentment over the being treated as a peripheral player, progressively marginalized with most international institutions and their decision-making on major global and regional issues. The possible interference in US elections represents, if it really happens, 
a rather brazen effort to take revenge for this peripheral position and status. Western sanctions didn't have the desired effect on the ruling elite in Russia. Moreover, the latest report shows that the wealth of Russian billionaires during the pandemic increased by 20% and reached about $468 billion until now. The West's hardline approach is highly likely to backfire by strengthening the regime and hardening nationalistic support of its foreign ventures and policies. Then the question about the future Russia. Ultimately, in the long run, the regime is of course doomed. I agree with those who believe that this regime is doomed. Putin's system cannot last too long because its built-in defects will prevent it from maintaining continuous control over political and business life of a big country. Members of the ruling circle will become aware of the looming crisis and the need for change. Inevitably, that will require either a deep review of the system or a reform of political life on completely different principles, which would also invite radical changes in business life. However, however before that happens, the system will have to travel the entire road from supposed triumph to actual collapse. Here is how regime change can occur. If present day authoritarian regimes ever lose their grip on society, it usually is caused not by some external impact or by lack of international competitiveness. Rather, it typically comes about for internal reasons. For most uh, among these is the regime inability to maintain control over economic, political, and social developments within, the, within its own jurisdiction. This failure, in turn, may occur simply because several things go wrong at the same time, or more often because of mistakes or, or erratic decisions by the ruling circle or the autocratic leader. But this year was very special. This year, I mean 2020. And not because of uh, epidemic, not because of pandemic and coronavirus. It was politically very special. Two things of the unprecedented importance happened this year. I mean, the year which, which in the past year. The main event of the outgoing year uh, is the end of the era of post-Soviet modernization. It's a very remarkable thing. And the introduction of the regime of unlimited personal power of Mr. Putin. Formally, the line was drawn by a plebiscite on the amendments on the so-called amendments on the constitution. This happened on July 1, 2020. A new era has begun. Therefore, in 2020, the following questions have already been arised in full on the development of a new constitution for Russia and the constituent assembly on the transition from extremely inefficient and backward state capitalism to a normal competitive market economy 
based on untouchable private property to an economy that will raise the standard of living and not condemn millions of people to poverty. About the new federal construction of the state, about the fundamentally different foreign policy that creates friends and allies, not enemies, along the entire perimeter of the borders. In other words, the events of the past year have brought us close to developing a full-fledged alternative to the impulse into the which the successes of Bolshevik course have led us. And today, the main question is who will replace Putin and how to implement this change bloodlessly. The second event is a poisoning of Alexei Navalny. The poisoning of Navalny, if it really happened, is an absolute crime. An international criminal investigation is absolutely necessary and should have been initiated immediately by Russia, but it was not done. Putin personally bears full political responsibility for what happened to Navalny, because Navalny is a critic of the regime, of Putin's regime. In fact, this is the most serious question about state political terror in Russia. This concerns the murders of Boris Nemtsov, Anna Politkovska, Yuri Shikachikin, Natalia Istemirova, Farid Babayev, Larisa Yudina. All these people were open and harsh critics of the Russian regime and the president personally for their deaths, as well as for the poisoning of Navalny. I would repeat it, all political responsibility is borne by the head of state, Vladimir Putin. The duty in this, in this circumstances, the duty of all healthy political forces in Russia is to make an effort to develop and to put forward a realistic alternative, truly practical plan to overcome the present crisis. If necessary, this plan may need to be imposed upon Russia's fearful and disorientated political elite. By the time Russia approaches the next fork on the road, there must be well-educated and politically acute people ready to use the moment of truth to implement necessary political institutions. That's why I thought it is necessary, and it was necessary and important to take the opportunity to talk to the nation. I did it as a presidential candidate in the recent 2018 campaign. That's why I have the honor to argue about my country with you now. We must work for the future by cultivating the soil for a forthcoming new politics in Russia. Thank you for your attention. And I'm ready for my very important debate with Jonathan Brandt. Thank you, Grigori. I'm clapping for everybody. I think that was a wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I have, uh, I have a series of questions uh, that I hope will stimulate uh, other questions. And I hope uh, that when you and I uh, finish that the, uh, that the audience will, uh, will ask questions as well. Uh, these, uh, those questions will be um, handled by uh, either Alex or Jane. Uh, 
uh, who are with us from my, who are, who are my colleagues at Evo. You have mentioned several times in your presentation uh, that Putin is responsible for the overall construction of the Russian, present Russian government, present Russian economy, the criminal capitalism. But could you describe a little bit the way this power that he possesses is actually how it actually works? How does it really work with the oligarchs, with the heads of industry, with the banks? Do we know? Does he give direct orders? Does he work as Stalin worked through the quote unquote middle cadres? Uh, who simply interpret what he wants and does it. And if they don't do it, if people resist, what happens to them in this system? Uh, to make the long story short, I will give the answer like this. This is the system of power which is based on fear. Everybody is simply afraid. Why? Because this is the system where you have no independent justice. The whole justice works just uh, reacting on the Putin orders. So every oligarch or every bureaucrat or every person in the country 140 million people population can feel himself under the threat of just whatever investigation and putting into prison. Or I'll put it in a different way. It's a system of opening and closing eyes. When you are uh, doing something and the corruption in this system is almost inevitable for the bureaucrats and uh, also for the oligarchs because they are just giving this money and the um, bureaucrats are taking this money. So the eyes of Putin are closed to the momentum when he's interested to open them. And that's the beginning of the very unpleasant story for all the players. So it's the kind of a Stalin system when everybody is guilty, simply everybody. And you can be on the safe side in the morning and you can be on the bad side uh, at the evening, the same day, doing all the same. There is no uh, ideological or whatever different uh, protection in this system, even less than in the communist system. It simply just happened because of different uh, clashes, but Putin's system is based on terrible fear of the people because there is no independent law and independent justice. Do you think that this fear is worse under Putin than it was under Brezhnev? Um, in some aspects, yes, uh, because under Brezhnev there were some rules. If you are accepting these rules, then on 80% you are on the safe side. Simply you are just uh, uh, ideologically uh, supporting the communist party and Soviet regime and so on and so far. You are not uh, going in touch with the dissidents. You are not trying to travel abroad. You are not trying to leave the country. You, you, are, you, have, you, you have no connections with the foreigners. 
and your relatives have no connections with the foreigners. You are living completely isolated life and everybody knows these rules. If you are execute these rules, then 90% that nothing happened. If you are violating this rule, rules, 90% that some bad things to you will happen. In the Putin system, there is no this rules, simply no rules. You don't know what you are going to say or not to say, to support or not to support. You can do what you want. But if you become a problem or simply somebody wants to confiscate everything you have, you will be just in a terrible situation. This is the this is a very interesting uh, uh, feature of the system that there is no rules of the game. <laughs> Simply, everybody is under this uh, under under this threat, and that's how he operate the system. You can't escape, even if you are living abroad. If you would even try to live abroad, the special people will find you there. So it's a it's a serious story. Uh, Putin won the election in 2000. Uh, he was supported by the majority of Russians at that time, as far as I understand. Many of them who supported uh, Putin at that time were reacting to what they perceived to be the chaos of the Yeltsin period. Uh, the hyperinflation, the disappearance of their savings, and so on and so forth. Do you, do you think that, that Putin standing for stability, which you say is becoming stagnation, but that he represented a kind of uh, response to the chaos of the 90s? It was such a hope that he will uh, represent the response to the the cares of, as you said, of 90s. Uh, this is a special story, which is very important to understand, very important to understand uh, what happened in 90s, what kind of reforms were executed in 90s, how these reforms were supported by IMF and the uh, United States and the Washington consensus. What was the outcome of all that? Uh, this hyperinflation, 2,600% two, a year was one of the consequences of that and criminal privatization also was one of the recipe which came just from abroad. Uh, so on. It's a it's a special story, and it's very, everybody who wants to understand current Russia have to uh, understand the lessons coming from from this reforms. It's it's critically important. Another th another thing is that during the nineties, uh, it was created that kind of a system and regime, which. Uh, uh, demand to suppress the justice and freedom of speech and press. So all this came together and certainly Putin got it in that case. And he was presented as a personality uh, for stability or for whatever. Uh, also that means that Yeltsin was a, a much older and he was not very good in his health. So Putin was young, very young. He was 48 years old and he was just a young personality which, which uh, have uh, a lot of uh, hope. But everybody knew that he is a man from KGB. And it was clear that he would be a modern communist and Bolshevik type of a leader. 
If to speak about Zuganov, the leader of the Russian communists, he's a very uh, old fashioned personality. And Putin, it was clear from the very beginning and from his biography and from his first steps uh, was the man which presents the postmodern communism. That's what we have today. This is a kind of a uh, communism or Bolshevism in postmodern style, if you want. So when the people were talking about the stability, the question is of what kind of stability they mean. I can say, of course, that the 100% stability is on is in cemetery. So if to speak about this stability, I'm also supporter of stability, but I'm supporter of stability, which means a stable progress, moving to more effective economy, to more effective state, to more effective government, to more transparent government. Stability in a sense move from the worse to the better. That kind of stability is important. But with the, under the Putin rule, it was a different stability. It was a stability of moving back. Control on press, uh, of media, control on free speech, uh, limitation of business uh, uh, competition, limitation of private property. There is no private property rights, untouchable private property rights until today. The main goal of the reforms of 1991 and 1992 to create the middle class, to create the real untouchable private property doesn't happen until the January 2021 as we have it today. And by the way, the pandemic uh, period shows the uh, very high level of ignorance uh, from the government to the middle and small businesses. They simply don't want to support them. The all developed countries of the world spend about 20% of GDP to support the people and businesses during the uh, this uh, uh, last year, huh? during the pandemic, when it was the lockdown and all these things. In Russia, was less than 2% was spent to support the private businesses and the population. Simply the government don't care about them. And all the money was still spent for military purposes and for police and for uh, special services of special forces and things like that. This is, everybody knows that. This is also a kind of stability, but it's a negative stability. So Putin brought the negative stability. And the problem with many people who were supporting uh, at the end of 90s was that the people uh, at that time don't see the difference between positive stability and negative stability. That's how it happens. But by the way, I want to say that uh, I'm not sure that he won the elections from the very beginning in the first round because it was about 52% or something like that. And I got 25% in Moscow, by the way, in these elections. That means that uh, at that period of time, he had no this uh, unbelievable support, Majority. which yeah. came a little bit later. Mm -hmm. You have written about uh, Putin as a product of the system as much as an inventor of the system. 
And I wonder if you could say a couple of words about how you see him as being a product, not just uh, the creator of uh, this system, of the Putin system. Yes, uh, the pro the, the, from that point of view, uh, that was a heritage which he used these, this kind of uh, criminal privatization came to him as a heritage. It happens in 95, 96, 97. And that was his obligation, which, which he gave to Yeltsin, that he is not going to touch it. That he would leave this property rights, if in brackets, if you can say property rights, that he would leave the results of privatization of this semi-criminal privatization untouchable. And he did it. He didn't touch them, but he managed all them because through several cases, he showed to this so-called oligarchs that he is prepared just to take from them this property and to put them into prison if they would not execute what he is telling to them. And so after one or two examples, they became very smooth and very prepared to be almost political and business slaves of the regime or business political and business slaves of Mr. Putin. That's, that's the story which we have today, for example. They can't even open the mouth and to move singly a, a, a finger because the next momentum would be, everything would be just taken from them and they would be in the prison. We have an example of such type. You know, everybody knows that kind of examples. So that, that is the basis of the system. The, the main fundamentals happened in the middle of 90s. That were the basic fundamentals, cornerstones of this system. And they work today. And they created the Putin and he's using that and he's operating through that. And he had an uh, unbelievable, um, unprecedented advantage. He got the prices on oil more than $140, $150 a, a barrel. So he have money coming from the from the from the sky simply. Yes? And that's made the very and that was a long period of time, about about eight or seven years and that bring him on the top of power and the people were very happy about that because russia never been having such incomes like that period of time to compare simply i i'll tell you to, in in the middle of 90s the prices of oil was 13 one three 13 dollars a barrel can you imagine and during Putin, 140 or 150. So this is easy to understand that, simply easy to understand. But this is a different thing from creating a system, political system, transparent system, open system, a liberal system, uh, honest political system. This money certainly was very useful to strengthen uh, that put, that kind of a Putin system, but there are one one issue which still uh, Putin is not able to to solve. Still, we have no machinery to change the man in power. That's why he changed the constitution. And can you imagine? Now he opened the door for himself that he can stay in power until 2036, so 15 years from now, more, 2036, he would be in power 36 years. Why he did that? Because 
no answer on the question how to change the power, how to find the successor, how to find the, the alternative figure. There is no real elections. There is no political competition. There is no uh, strong political parties because of many things, and including political terror, which I was telling you. The killing of Nemtsov two steps from Kremlin it's a serious event, serious, very serious sign. The, uh, the killing of Nimtsov uh, has never been solved, has it? Sorry? Has the killing of Nimtsov been solved? I, I don't think so. Do, do people know exactly who did it and what the lines of responsibility were? No, it is not, it is, it is not clear. Yeah. Even it is not clear, although it was a trial, it is not clear enough who did it practically. But there is zero uh, knowledge about who ordered that. Who was the person who ordered to kill the famous, really famous Russian politician, outstanding Russian politician simply to kill him. Two steps from Kremlin. Who did it? Who made the order? That is the question. And there is no answer at all. There, there is an answer that this or other person just was practically engaged. Not all of them, but some of them. I'm not sure whether it is real or not, but I'm interested not who, who, who had a gun in the hand. I'm interested who ordered that. Who took the decision? And what was the purpose? And there is no answer. So uh, it's a really political terror. Uh, Stalin rarely wrote orders down. Uh, he rarely gave specific orders to kill so-and-so. We still don't know whether he was responsible for the Kirov assassination, for instance in 1934. Does Putin work also in this way? In other words, does he work in a way so that those around him don't need an order in order to carry out what they believe to be his wishes? That's what I don't know. But once again, Jonathan, it was not simply my uh, will to make you happy with this lecture and to tell how outstanding you are, but it have a very big substance. The substance is that without real answers, what happened in Russia during the Stalin time in Soviet time, there is no way to create a new Russia, full stop. And you was the person who started that work. One of the most important people of doing that honestly and professionally. That's why you are, you, you are giving me a question which sends me again to the position to say that this is a neo-Bolsheviks this is a postmodern Stalinist system. So I don't know how that works in the era of internet, uh, cell phones, hackers, and so on. I know how it works in these conditions. But what I do know that when the uh, means Ju when the means justify the ends and you can do whatever, let's bring you, you see, when the ends justify the means, I mean, when, when you can do whatever in order to reach whatever goal. That was a, one of the key principles of Bolsheviks. Do what you want, only you have to, uh, and the 
And the other thing, the life of the human being is not important. You can do everything you want with the life of the, of the, of the human being. So uh, I'm not an investigator. I don't know how that all organized and worked, but I see the results of that. And I see the simultaneous things, uh, the same, the same formula or the, the same way of organizing things. And maybe you are right. Maybe this is enough just simply to please the, the boss, to please him. Because this is the man who is criticizing him and you are doing the things when you want to please him. Uh, um, that is possible. You've spoken about the total lack of a legal system. I guess the collapse of the prior Soviet legal system under Brezhnev. Do you see any means by which the legal system can be reconstructed? Or will that um, require the complete collapse of the Putin system? Uh, the first step, uh, so of course it's a, it's a long way to go, it's necessary to to have a, uh, the uh, maybe 5,000 days program to, to do that. It's a long way to go, but first of all, to have an independent justice, you need to have untouchable private property. You need to have people who are not afraid. You see, that, that is the substance of the story. If you have no private property, then you have no independent people. If you have no independent people, you have no independent justice. This is for the beginning. So you must have independent justice. For that purpose, you need independent people. To have independent people, you need real, untouchable private property. So you must have the incomes coming not from the state to the person. You must have middle class, which is not the past of a, uh, not the part of a state system. When when you have every almost everybody, this is a state capitalism which we have. When you have almost all population uh, related to the state on this or other way, you can't have independent justice. So this is my vision of that story. So uh, that doesn't mean that you should do first and second. No, you should do all this together in the same time. That's why I said that this year, the, the last year, uh, 2020, was a very important because it was a symbolic line that uh, modernization of the post-Soviet Russia, which started just in January 1992 when you came in Moscow, finished. And we failed. We failed, really. So, so we should start everything from the very beginning. Well, uh, one thing I want you to know, and I would like other reformers uh, in Russia to know, is that you have friends here in the United States. And uh, there are people who are paying attention. And there are people who remain interested and do want to help. I think Perhaps you're right, there needs to be an organization, a structure. Uh, most people have no idea how to help. Most people have no idea what to do. And I wanted to ask you as we get uh, maybe to, as, as maybe the last question uh, before we allow uh, our viewers to ask their questions. What do you see your role 
as a reformer to be today in Russia? And what are the dangers that you feel as a reformer in Russia today? I've, I've noticed on the chat that some people have asked whether you were afraid of poisoning yourself. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so, uh, could you speak about that a little bit? Yes. Uh, uh, I will try to react on all three parts of your question. Uh, what about the role uh, at the current situation, the role is to be prepared. Sooner or later, I don't know when, Russia would come to the crossroads, to the fork of the road. And for that momentum, the opposition forces, democratic forces must be prepared, having a program, what to do, having the manifesto, what we want to do. Uh, we must have a constitution or some basic ideas how Russia must be organized. We must have a concept how to speak with all other influential and the other political forces in Russia, how to address the people, what to explain to the people. Look, in some countries like Belarus, for example, it's a complete tragedy. The whole people are on the streets and they can't do anything. Of course, the main reason is because Putin supports Lukashenko, of course. But the other problem is that there is no prepared political structures and programs and so on and so far because it was not possible to, do, to make it legally in Belarus. So, and when the momentum will come, we must be prepared. We must have program, we must have political structures, and we must have leaders. It's necessary to prepare the new leaders, which would be able to fight and to fight seriously and to be prepared to take risks. It's not easy. So the society must be prepared for that. And this is the, this is the key, key role. And we need millions of supporters. Even our party in the current situation have a 70 departments in the uh, regions, 70, 70, 70 departments in the regions. Uh, of course, the people are afraid. Of course, the number of people are not such as we had before. We exist already about 30 years in Russia, but still there are people everywhere, almost everywhere in the country who are supporting a different approach. And the presidential election showed that there are about a million of the people who are supporting these ideas. So that's the, the minimum, what is necessary. Uh, to, and this is our task to prepare that. And then uh, on this basis, it is the task is to push the regime. Maybe it would be a dialogue. Maybe it would be something different. Nobody knows today how that works. But to make a long story short, to create real practical alternative in terms of what to do, how to do, and who's going to do it. To have such an alternative is the main task for the opposition at the moment. This is the first part of your question. The second part about threats. Threats are always, I explained the quality and the, the um, characteristics of this regime. So I'm not going to speak about that. It's not interesting. 
but this is the nature of 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 the situation and of the Putin system. And uh, uh, that's it. And by the way, one more issue. I'm very thankful that we have, as you said, friends in the United States, and we know that. Uh, but I want to underline that, dear friends, I think that your main task is to put your house in order. We'll do our job and you please do yours because we need an example. We need to show to the people how it must be realized in the United States and in Europe. So if you ask me how you can help, my answer is, I'm sorry, maybe you'll think that it's uh, too blunt, but I would say, please put your house in order. And that's the best help for us. We don't need anything. We don't need money. Honestly, we really don't need even advice, but we need the example. Please do it. Show how your institution works. Please show us how your presidents are working and how your country is just coming to the really democratic way of doing things. Because I'm, I have a lot of concerns about what's going on in the United States and in Europe, but mostly in the United States. I have a lot of concerns. Thank you for that. I think your admonition is uh, very well taken. I totally agree uh, with it. Um, now, uh, I would like to open uh, up discussion for questions from our audience. So Alex, would you choose those questions? Yes, uh, I've got uh, lots of questions from the audience. I don't think we'll have time for all of them, but thank you everyone for viewing. Um, and uh, for sharing these questions. So apropos um, of what you were just talking about, a lot of people are asking, um, how does Trump figure into this um, and how might things be different um, under a Biden administration? Uh, I'm sorry, once again, please. A lot of people are, lot of people are asking, are asking how, how Trump, how Donald Trump figures into this, um, what his relationship with Putin um, has been like because of, you know, all of the factors that you're saying um, and how a Biden's relationship may be different or how that might change things? Mm. I would put it in that way. Uh, the first step will be the negotiations about uh, nuclear weapons about uh, prolonging the SART three treaty. So it's the question number one, because the end of uh, this treaty is coming uh, on the control of the nuclear uh, ballistic missiles and nuclear uh, weapons just in two or three weeks from now. And that will be a first, uh, first year after 60 years when uh, it it was uh, it have a lot of treaties and it was uh, under control, so I think it's an extremely uh, dangerous situation because if to be very serious, we should discuss with you just now how to avoid the war, because no no any limits no control and no uh, no trust from any side to each other. Uh, neither Trump nor Putin did anything to just to pro to preserve the uh, this nuclear anti-nuclear agreements. This is a very real serious threat because it can can happen any day. So I think it is a question number one: if Mr. Biden would be able to find the way how to prolong this treaty on nuclear weapons, on control on the nuclear weapons. 
That's, that is, that'll be the first step, number one, very important. All the other things would be later. Let's, let's start with this. If that would work, then it can be second and so on and so on. And how do you explain Trump's sycophantic relationship with Putin? Do you, is, do, does this make sense given the Putin system? Do you have any, how does it fit into your analysis? Uh, I would try to explain that in that way. Uh, uh, I would try to say that Putin political version of capitalism, I would say like sometimes you can read it in uh, some outstanding newspapers in Financial Times, for example, a kind of a demagogic authoritarian capitalism. Yeah. Uh, in Russia, it has uh, uh, consequences of the collapsed communism. It's, uh, in Russia, it rises as a collapsed after, after communism. But uh, demagogic authoritarian capitalism is a kind of hybrid. The ruler is above the law and democratically unaccountable. Elections are a shame. Power is personal, not institutionalized. And this is a kind of, a, as uh, Martin Wolf put it in Financial Times, this is a corrupt gangster politics. It rests on personal loyalty of cronies. Often the core consists of the family members viewed as most trustworthy of all. This is the political system, the experts saying which Mr. Trump wished to install in the United States. And it's very close to the uh, political system which we have in Russia or you, you can find in Turkey or you can find in some other countries as well, in Brazil, for example. So it's much more, more serious. I, I would put it in that way that uh, uh, maybe it would be right to say that, uh, 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 for example, as, as Mr. Trump uh, put it, the truth is what he says it is. A fair elections, only fair elections is one, one he wins. If he wins, this is a fair election. If he don't win, then not. And a good official is one who is loyal. That, that this is mm, very special uh, vision of life. And it is not belonged only to Putin. I can, can find a lot of countries uh, just now. And uh, now we are living in the world where the number of democratic countries decrease democratic systems and the autocratic almost uh, fascist countries increase maybe you know there is a letter of 80 uh, scientists who are look, uh, who are working with the uh, totalitarian regimes and nazi regimes who wrote the open letter three months ago that they are afraid of uh, fascism in the world, which is coming out. So I want to say that uh, this is a, a question which is much wider than the issues of Russia and Russian political system. This is uh, something which is related to the world uh, as a whole and on developed world and Western world, if you want, and also related to the new system of information technologies and uh, the controversial uh, consequences of uh, information technologies uh, like uh, what happens with information, with fake news, what happens with the newspapers, what happens with the uh, uh, this internet giants, and how that uh, uh, influence on the people, this is the very serious question which gives the way to 
the uh, uh, demagogic, or if you say, populistic political approach. And this is a problem of the whole political systems in the world. This populism is uh, coming to power and the populism is not able to reach the goals which he promised. Then he is looking for who? He's, the populists are looking for enemies. Who are the enemies? The enemies are all the others. So it's a nationalism. After populism, we are coming to nationalism and the nationalism is the open doors for the war. So it's all is a very serious story and it's not related only to Russia and not related to Putin's system itself. It is much more wider. Another question um, related to American politics that's been coming up uh, and a lot of the questions here is what do you think is the motivation uh, behind the cyber uh, attacks and the, the hacking that's been happening? If there's, uh, first of all, I'll be very honest. I don't know whether it happens or not and who did it. I have no answer on that. To say that it, it was done by Russia, possible, why not? Uh, why, why that happens? It happens because uh, Russia want to show that uh, it can influence on the politics of uh, uh, such uh, serious countries, such a big countries as, a, as, as the United States, for example, and can interfere. And it's a kind, um, it's, it's a kind as a, um, uh, uh, of realizing uh, um, uh, realizing the feeling that uh, we are out of uh, the main decisions, we are out of the G7, we are out of uh, a lot of international uh, uh, organization. It's a kind of a realizing the complex of inferiority, you know to show that we are just a players. If you, you don't to speak with us around the table, we would show you that we can do it in, a, in that kind of a negative way. It's a kind of a inferiority. So the only way to stop it is to be protected. And I think such country like United States have enough money to create the, the wall which would protect them from that things. But I don't know who's doing that. It's very possible that Russia can do that, but I don't know. Uh, moving back to, to issues in Russia, um, a bunch of people have asked about um, Gorbachev and have pointed out that there was optimism um, for a period of time and are asking what went wrong, um, either on Gorbachev's part or um, in the international community First of all, I want to say that uh, in March this year, it will be 90 years anniversary of Mr. Gorbachev. And I wish him all the best. And I want just to everybody who hear me just to support him and to pray. He's not very good, but he's about 90 in March. So I would be happy if many people would congratulate him. He deserved that. He did the main thing, he gave freedom. Listen, he gave freedom for free. Without blood. And he gave freedom to the people who, who even were not asking him for that. What we did with this freedom. This is our problem and our business, not his. He gave real freedom. He opened the doors of the, of, of, of the cage or of the prison and said, you are free. You, you can live as you want. Not only for Soviet Union, 
but for Eastern Europe. So it's a big, big number of people. So Gorbachev did the unbelievable thing. Without blood, gave freedom to everybody. For those who want freedom and for those who do not even think about that. Uh, what went wrong? As I told you, after Gorbachev, we started reforms. And during these reforms was made a lot of mistakes and even crimes. Uh, the plan of reform was, which was practically realized, the reforms which were practically realized, started with 2,600% inflation. So the consequence was criminality, uh, and uh, the consequence uh, of that was a chaos, and then cri uh, criminal privatization, and then it became a cornerstone of a new system, and then Putin came, got uh, very high prices on oil, and strengthened that system, and that's what we have today. That's this is there is no special secrets of doing that, and that was clear. Uh, that was clear at that period of time. I wrote in the Foreign Affairs an article uh, in the uh, second part of 90s, which was called Russia's Phony Capitalism. If you would be interested, please, you can have a look. I was trying very cautiously explain what would happen. And that, it's a pity, but that's happened. So Gorbachev opened the door, he gave freedom. After him, the, there were very serious mistakes and even not only mistakes, but also crimes. But one more thing, which is related to, once again, I would say it, to academician Jonathan Brandt. Until the country would not have a clear answer what happens during Stalinist period and Soviet system, never ever economic or whatever other reforms would be successful. It is necessary to explain the people what happened in Russia after 1917 during Bolshevik and Stalinist and Soviet time and to learn these lessons very, very seriously. Along those lines, perhaps a final question or two interrelated questions that have come up. Um, what role does the independent press play in Russia today? Um, and how is this history taught? Um, what role does education play? Um, the major sources of information in Russia still is the television. The all television is in the hands of the Putin authorities. The all influential political media, all influential newspapers, all television is just preoccupied by the regime. There are brave independent media like uh, Nova Gazeta, for example. It's just, uh, in English, it's important to see, but the, their influence, their political influence is very limited. And uh, what I can say uh, very clearly that as a political factor, we have no freedom of speech, whatever. I can say, tell you that if you would speak to Russian journalists and ask them whether they have freedom of speech, they would tell them, tell you that yes, we have a freedom of speech. The question is what would happen after the speech? That's that's what that's the the mood on this 
We have a freedom of speech, but what would happen after the speech? Well, you can say what you want, but what would happen after that? So seriously speaking, that, that, is, the, that is the situation. And this is one of the reasons why opposition is in a very weak situation, because without communication. And internet is not enough communication. It is very diverse and uh, very organized in the way of bubbles. And these bubbles are not communicating which is with, which, with one another. And in that situation, you can't make a real understanding in the country of uh, what's going on. Education, we have under the state control and uh, it's became more and more uh, conservative. And uh, I would say even uh, looks like more and more like propaganda, the educate, especially after this uh, amendments into the constitution, uh, they, they became more and more uh, reactionary, I would say. Some reaction uh, elements coming uh, to, to the educational system. There is a lot of control the parliament uh, is taking decisions almost uh, every day to establish control and to have an ideological influence and propaganda influence on education. The level of that is coming up more and more. So uh, uh, concluding all this, I would say, this is a long way to go to find the way to the modern uh, country and modern state after 100 years of communism is a difficult venture, is a very difficult road. And uh, we made the first step. First step was the 30 years we failed. We would understand the lessons and we would make new efforts. And then the new generations would have a new efforts. Uh, new steps, and maybe they would be more successful than we are. We pay the, sometimes a very high price for that, but we are creating our country for ourselves. I believe in my country. I like my people very much, and I think sooner or later we would win. And I wish you all success, and I wish uh, that in your countries, you will have a prosperity and freedom. Thank you so much, uh, Grigori. Um, I'm very, very grateful for your talk. Uh, people who have uh, additional questions, perhaps uh, you can send them to us at Yibo, and if possible, uh, we can uh, uh, help you find answers. I invite everyone to uh, become a member of the YIVO Institute to visit our website, which I think has already been posted. And uh, you may wish to check out uh, the winter program. There are still some places available in some of the courses that are being offered, which start today. So thank you very, very much, Grigori. It was a pleasure. It was most informative. Uh, we have learned a lot. Uh, it could go on for quite a bit longer, I'm afraid. Um, but uh, we'll have to end here. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you so Thank much. You